you already. I'm David, for those of you who are my mom. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about the research I've been doing under the supervision of Dr. Carolyn Isles and Dr. Sarah Simmons in the field of science communication, specifically perceptions regarding communication of scientific research to non-specialist audiences in the context of McMaster University. So this is a little bit different from what you've seen in other thesis presentations because I'm talking about science communication and not necessarily science itself. So I'll give you a little bit of background to sort of convince you that what I'm doing is important and relevant. There exists this scientific divide that the ideas and perceptions held by the general public is different what's, than what scientists are saying. So in 2014, the Pew Institute ran this uh, survey where they surveyed members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, who are scientists and members of the general public, and this is what they found. So with respect to the statement, is it safe to eat genetically modified food? 87% of scientists agreed that it was, while only, I'm sorry, 88%, while only 37% of the general public did, representing a 51% gap. The same gap is seen with other statements, like is climate change caused mostly by human activity? 87% of scientists agreed with that, while only 50% of the general public did. Should the, the vaccine for mumps, measles, and rubella, MMR, be required? 86% of scientists agreed, only 68% of the general public did. And finally, the clincher, humans have evolved over time, 98% of scientists agreed, <laughs> 65% of the general public. So this divide isn't as pronounced in Canada, but it is still existent in Canada as well. You may be wondering, does it matter if the general public doesn't uh, agree with what scientists have to say? And it turns out that it does. <laughs> so here's a good example is the number of measles cases reported in the US starting in 2001. So you can see it's kind of constant until 2014, you see this huge spike. And then I've, they have data at the Center of Disease Control where I got this information, has data through the middle of March, and I've extrapolated that to what my projection would be for 2015, and you can see that there's this issue that since people don't believe that this is important, that you see these real world consequences. Now you might be wondering why does this uh, exist? So here we have some scientists, as you all know, scientists always wear lab coats <laughs> and latex gloves, and you have this amorphous blob which represents the public. And something's <laughs> happening in between that's preventing information from getting through. So there's two major categories of, of obstacles that I identified and that the literature talks about. One is that there's not enough information flowing. So this could be the result of things like payroll restrictions, where a lot of academic journals require you to pay to view the journal. So most people don't actually have access to a lot of peer-reviewed uh, research. At the same time, scientists like to use jargon. So even though a lot of you are science students, you'll know that sometimes scientists are hard to understand. They use a lot of scientific words. Uh, there's also the fact that there could be media distortion. So information often goes from the scientists to the public, but has to go through the media as an intermediary, which is full of inherent biases. And finally, what I'm particularly concerned about is maybe there isn't enough outreach being done by scientists to communicate with the public. Also worth considering is the mistrust of scientists. That could happen from things like confirmation bias, so the idea <coughs> that any previously held notion you might have, you'll be able to find someone in the internet age who agrees with you online, so you, that supports your, whatever your belief is, even if it's not what scientists would say. There's also unclear methodology. People might not agree with a scientist's conclusion if they don't understand how they got the result. And familiarity. You're more likely to believe your neighbor than you are uh, believe the scientific community who you might not actually know anyone in the scientific community. Putting this in the context of McMaster, this is what Dr. Patrick Dean, the president, had to say about community engagement. Rather than relegate community engagement to the status of a free-floating add-on, something we do on our own time, we need to integrate it fully and meaningfully into the work of the academy. And he said this in his forward of the integrity letter in 2011, to outline a vision for the university, and of course, when you Google forward with integrity, the one of the first images coming up is Dr. Chad Harvey doing a poster presentation. <laughs> <laughs> On to my present study and what I did. So we know that there's this divide, and we want to apply it at McMaster. So I had a few research goals. The first being identify what's the state of science communication at McMaster. What are scientists at MAC doing? Then also, why are they choosing to participate in these activities, or why are they choosing to not participate, which is equally important. Uh, what are their attitudes towards this participation? And in particular, who do they think is responsible for community outreach, science outreach? And finally, what can we do at McMaster to improve the effectiveness of this process? And my methods I used were I had a Lyme survey that I sent out to all of the professors in the Faculty of Science at Mac. Unfortunately, I only got 17 responses, which uh, seems like not a lot, but considering I got 17 uh, professors to not only respond to my email, but also participate in a survey, 
that seems like a pretty good ratio. Um, and I can make a lot of qualitative inferences from that. So I divided my results into six different sections concerning science engagement and communication at McMaster. Uh, those being current involvement, the perceived importance of these activities, some motivations and deterrents for participating in these activities, responsibility, whose responsibility is it to be doing this, and finally some potential incentives or ways that we can improve the efficiency of this process. In terms of current involvement, this is what we saw. They're asked to quantify how many times they've done different outreach activities within the last 12 months. 13 of my 17 respondents said that they had participated in at least one open day, those being things like Fall Preview Day, May at Mac, where they interact with the public. 11 of 17 had said that they had worked with schools and school teachers within the last 12 months. And only three respondents said that they had worked with policy makers within the last 12 months. In terms of perceived importance, uh, they were asked to rate how important they thought it was to interact with each of these groups. So I'm going to be using a lot of these graphs, so I'm going to explain how they work. So in this case, one was not important and five was very important. So the number of people who responded to one is indicated in dark gray here and five in blue. Uh, and in particular with all these slides, I'm going to highlight in orange what was the most agreeable or most important statement. So here, policymakers, a lot of people have said four or five in terms of importance, and general journalists were viewed as not very important to communicate with. <laughs> In terms of, I also want to look at when they're communicating with these groups, what do they think is important to talk about. So these topics, which are things relating to science in general, the relevance of science to everyday life, the enjoyment of doing science, and the scientific process were quite important in the responses, and things relating to a scientist's individual research, so things like the benefits of your work, or the implications of your work, or the findings of your work, were not viewed as important to communicate with the general public. In terms of motivations, I want to look at what potentially could be motivating factors, what people feel when they want to participate in these activities. And the most uh, agreeable statement now, uh, dark is representing strongly disagree to strongly agree. You can see that the most agreeable statement was that science communication is personally rewarding, which is a good sign to see. And the, the most disagreeable statement is that it is not. There's no benefits to it. So this is showing that the scientists who responded to the survey have this positive attitude towards science communication. Looking at deterrence, I wanted to see uh, what could possibly be preventing people from communicating. So it's important to note here that most of the responses for deterrence are agree, disagree or neutral, whereas for motivations, there's more people that are agreeing. So the general trend there is that uh, scientists at McMaster are more agreeable than disagreeable when it comes to community outreach. And the most agreeable with here was that scientists said that they would need help to develop an outreach project. They might not be willing to do it on their own. And the most disagreeable is that scientists who communicate are not well regarded by their peers, so people disagree with that statement. Looking at responsibility, whose responsibility it is to be engaging in these activities or uh, designing these activities, the most agreed with statement was that scientists would participate in an outreach activity if someone else was to do the organization, which kind of makes sense. And the most disagreeable statement here is that engagement is best done by senior researchers. So there isn't this notion that only a certain level of seniority should be engaged in your research. Instead, it's more of a, if you're interested in it and able to do it, you should be doing it. Okay, and then finally, I went into potential incentives, things that could be done to make people want to do more community outreach. Uh, here, it says how encouraged they would be by each of the different statements, black being not at all to blue being a great deal. People said that they would be most encouraged if these outreach activities brought money into the department and also if they had support or encouragement from their department head. So again, that gets back to the idea if their department head told them to do it, they would do it, but they wouldn't necessarily do it on their own. And the most, the least helpful uh, of these factors was needing more training. So it's not that people didn't have the training to do it or didn't feel that they had the training, it was just they weren't either given the opportunities or weren't explicitly told that they should be in a community area. I wanted to come up with some actions uh, for McMaster to improve its science communication. My first action was based on the results, or the observations. The scientists said they would participate in an act outreach activity if someone else did the organizing. Only 76% of, or sorry, 76 of the respondents had participated in, in an open day within the last 12 months, and those are typically organized at the faculty or departmental level. And there's a public relations office at McMaster where there's really only two people involved in media outreach servicing the entire university. So my recommendation from all that is that we should introduce a faculty of science-specific 
outreach coordinator to facilitate these projects. One that allows a more personal level of saying, oh, you should be working on these activities. Plus, uh, the Faculty of Science has their own public relations office, so it would make sense for science faculty, which is the biggest faculty, to also have our own public uh, outreach person. Okay. My second re recommended action, uh, I'm only going to present two here, is that respondents identified policymakers as being the most important group to interact with, but only 17% had actually interacted with policymakers in the last 12 months. And, if I can get this to come up, policymakers were also identified as the hardest group to interact with. So a good recommendation for the university as a whole would to be facilitate these interactions between scientists or just all professors at McMaster and policymakers. To conclude and to sort of talk about what I've talked about, the, there are these barriers that exist between scientists and the general public that prevent them from having agreement on a lot of different issues concerning science. McMaster science, scientists in general were open to this idea of doing more community outreach and science engagement activities. Scientists were more concerned with sharing topics relating to science in general rather than the specifics of their research. Uh, they tended to be more passive than active, so they would do activities if someone were to approach them and ask them to do it but not necessarily seek out opportunities to do outreach themselves. And finally, there are several opportunities for McMaster to improve, which seems to be a goal as outlined by Patrick Dean in the Forward with Integrity letter. I'd like to make a couple of acknowledgements, a few acknowledgements. Uh, my thesis supervisors, Carolyn and Sarah, for allowing me to switch my projects late in the year. Uh, all of my study participants, some of the people that answered my questionnaire, and I also conducted a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews, so everyone who participated in that. My family and friends, some of you are here today. Uh, not mutually exclusive to friends as the ISA class. <laughs> <laughs> and here is a, a cheesy picture of all of us. Thank you. I think my animation works here. <laughs> yep, it helped. Um, so, whenever you're performing a, a study that takes into account voluntary um, participation, you have to be concerned with, you know, whether the people who are responding are in any way biased. So, with that in mind, uh, how generalizable do you think that your results are to the general population of professors at McMaster and perhaps in academia in general? I think it's indicative my study group, the people that are choosing to respond to a survey about science communication are always also the people in general that will be participating in the science communication activities. So I think in terms of developing uh, ideas to get people to participate more, now, these are the people that are, would be willing to participate if there were these opportunities in place. So I think that this is sort of the target group that we want to design activities for. Um, I understand that there will always be professors who don't want to participate in anything outside of what they are like contractually obligated to do. And those also might not be people that if you want to get a good image for a professor, you want to be in the public. So I think that it's somewhat limited, and I acknowledge that, but uh, I think that this sample group is representative of the kind of people that would be participating in these activities. Yeah, uh, let's go Pratt. Um, did you perhaps look at how like the discipline that the scientist was involved in might affect their response on this? Because like, I would imagine that some scientists might be more difficult to communicate. So of my 17 respondents, I only had like a maximum of four from any given faculty, or sorry, department, because they were sent out to all the different departments. So I couldn't really make uh, very strong arguments in that sense. But I also conducted interviews that were within a bunch of different disciplines. So things like, uh, like health sciences, for example, or biology might be more relevant to the public than if you're doing, sadly, like earth science, for some reason, isn't considered as relevant. I don't know why, but that was what the trend I got from my interviews. Matt? Were the research interests of any of the professors that participated, uh, were they similar to sort of any of the big uh, questions that we have for this society, like in terms of like vaccines or like climate change, like were their research interests like aligned with that or were they different? I think all of the departments in science have topics that are sort of like hot topic issues. I only showed a couple of them. But for example, like space, uh, if you're doing research in astronomy, space exploration and funding for it uh, is pretty big. So pretty much any scientific discipline, there are going to be issues that are relevant to the public because they could affect them or because there's supposed to be funding going towards that. And so the, I guess the big thing here is that the non-specialist public doesn't just refer to like lay people also means like politicians and anyone who's not a scientist. So I think in all of those issues, there's like 
groups that need to be targeted. Uh, ben? Uh, so I was interested by your uh, policy maker recommendation, and I'm just curious, like, from your research, so I don't really know how outreach or communication with policymakers usually happens. Like, I would kind of expect that it's usually the policymakers have to kind of come to us. Like, you can't just be like, hey, man, like, listen to my research and just vote differently now, please. And I'm just curious, like, what your, if you have anything else to say. Maybe. So one of the main interactions is, like, if policymakers already have a contact in an area, then they'll continue to contact that person. There's also conferences where policymakers would interact with uh, researchers in that field. Um, a lot of researchers, in, especially in health-related disciplines, write white papers that, but from my interviews, what I've heard is they write these white papers giving recommendations, and then they don't actually know whatever happens with that. So that could be an issue where the university could sort of facilitate some system to make that process more efficient, that if we're doing things for policymakers, we want to know how that's actually being used by the policymakers. Okay. So a lot of the examples that you gave us at the beginning about the divide between scientists and policymakers were about specific scientific findings, mm -hmm. but you said that a lot of the scientists didn't find that those findings were as important to share, and they thought talking about science in general was more important to communicate. Um, would you recommend that if uh, the amount of um, sharing that was happening at McMaster, um, would you recommend for that to be specific scientific results, or just science in general is great? What, would, what do you think? I think both. Um, I think the idea here, what the researchers were trying to get at, was that uh, making people scientifically literate makes them more likely to believe or to agree with scientists on a number of issues, not necessarily specific to their research. So that issue of trust that I talked about at the beginning, I think is the most important issue here, and that if, we, if science is communicated in a general sense, that could help build trust in scientists so that they so that the public essentially is just like this on more issues. Um, yeah, I, does that sort of answer your question? Okay. Uh, Alex? Do you think that there's any role that the undergraduate student, graduate student populace could play in furthering scientific communication? Mm -hmm. One of my recommendations that I didn't show here that I came up with was the idea of designing a course uh, for undergraduate students that focuses on creating uh, educational materials for other use in like camps for science, for like science enrichment camps or uh, in schools themselves. So that would, the designing of that course would get uh, professors and McMaster involved in that, and then just having that attitude of science communication as a thing that we do and it's part of like our academics and the like, philosophy of the university I think is important. So that's one of the recommendations I have in my paper that's not in this presentation. Matt again? Uh, <laughs> So I'm, like I know that sometimes maybe the, there's like some sort of barrier in terms of a uh, culture or religion that could be present. Do you think scientists should play any sort of role in terms of like knowledge transmission and something like that comes up? Uh, yeah. So like I guess you're referring to some of those divides. Like for example, the evolution one is a very religiously fueled uh, debate. I think the idea of building scientific literacy, especially from a young age. So I've mentioned that a lot of uh, scientists had interacted with schools and school teachers, I think is important because if you build a trust and understanding of science early on, you're more likely to agree with scientific findings later on. I guess and I guess Bill's presentation has some elements of that that you might learn good. Okay, thank you. starting because you didn't have the camera ready, but then I just like... <laughs> I was ready, don't worry. Okay. It's still going. Okay. Do you want to say anything to your dad? Happy 420. Happy 420. Yeah. Claire, what'd you think? It was really good. <laughs> Hey Mr. Y, hope you're having fun on vacation. <laughs> <laughs>